Hi there, folks, and welcome back to uh, the final episode of uh, the 2020 TTD 3060 electronics uh, series of uh, how to make that stuff video. And today we're going to be talking about the water piano circuit. It's uh, it's a it's been going around the world for a while. This is not a brand new type of uh, circuit. I had it brought to my attention by uh, Rob Moslinger out at Walnut Grove Secondary. He runs a great electronics program there. And this is a really popular project with his students. And you can do it a number of ways. You can make printed circuit boards for it and all that. But because uh, of where our printed circuit board equipment is right now, uh, we're going to uh, build it on the breadboard. And so I've got my parts laid out right here. I've got my schematic laid out here. I'm going to talk about what some of the parts are and how they go together and a little bit about how the circuit works. But this is the first circuit that you're going to be making using an integrated circuit. And the, you couldn't pick a better circuit to use for your first integrated circuit project than the 555 timer. It is one of the all time most famous um, chips out there. Uh, it's been used for all sorts of things. It sort of formed the foundation of hobby electronics through the 1970s, 80s, and into the 90s, and uh, really only got kind of displaced a little bit when microcontrollers came along. Uh, to the point where the person who invented it uh, made sufficient contribution to humanity that when he passed away, his uh, obituary was actually covered in uh, page A3 of the Vancouver Sun. It, it was really uh, neat to see somebody who had made such a significant contribution, but in a humble way, uh, recognize that publicly. And anyways, this is your 555 timer chip. And if you hold it up right in here and I can get the focus right on it, that's what it looks through, like through my eyes sometimes is, uh, where are we here? Come on, camera, focus in right there. Maybe if I... There we go. And you can see it says 555 right on the top of it in there. Okay, now you'll notice a couple other things about the chip. And one of the things is it's got a notch chopped out of one end on it right in there. And uh, yeah, okay. Camera's not wanting to stay focused. Let's just put that back in my hand because it can focus on my hand. And there we go. So we've got that notch right in there. And that's a really important thing to note on any integrated circuit. You'll either see a notch right there or you'll see a little dot in that corner uh, just to the left of the notch. And the reason that's really important because every pin on an integrated circuit has a number. And you're going to see those numbers referred to uh, in the schematic and on the data sheet. And so this chip has eight pins going around like that. And to figure out which pin is which, come to that notch, come to the first pin right here, okay, right to the left. Normally there'd be a little dot right there on some other chips. And that's going to be pin one. Okay, so that's pin one right there, just to the left of the notch when you're holding it up like that. Then you've got pin two pin three, pin four, loop around to the bottom, keep going counterclockwise, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, and pretty much every integrated circuit that you run into is gonna be numbered like that. Find the notch or the little dot to indicate pin one and count counterclockwise, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight pins on there. Now you can get um, bigger chips, uh, so for instance, some of your Arduinos might have an integrated circuit that looks something like this. And uh, if we swing that around right on there, uh, you'll see the brain of the Arduino is an Atmega uh, 328 chip. And if I hold it just right and get the light on there, you can see where it says that. But anyway, there's the notch, there's a dot. And this one's a 28 pin chip, so you're 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 14, 15, 16, 17, 8, 28. Um, so it's just a little bit longer. You can get wider chips as well. And uh, these chips are all what we call in a dual inline package. And uh, in fact, if they're packaged in plastic, you'll also sometimes see them referred to as a P dip for plastic dual inline package. There's some older style chips that are also listed as C dips for ceramic dual inline packages because they had different ways of packaging them. Now, a couple things to know about them. Uh, the little legs of the chip are fairly fragile. 
Uh, okay, you want to be careful about them when you're plugging them into your breadboard or putting them into a circuit. And there's a lot of really tiny things crammed onto a chip. And I'll talk a little bit more about what's on this 555 timer in just a moment. But because there's a lot of really tiny things crammed into a chip, you could damage them with heat. So you really want to avoid soldering uh, the legs of the chip. You could do it if you absolutely have to. But if you're going to solder a chip somewhere, uh, make sure you solder one leg, do it quickly, and then wait a little bit, give it a chance to cool down. What we do to avoid soldering the chips is when it comes time to mount this onto your perf board, or if you're making a printed circuit board anywhere, is you'll use a socket for that chip to fit into. And the sockets come in a few different styles. I've included one uh, in your kit in case you go to make the perf board. And you can see this is an eight pin socket and it's got a little notch up at one end as well. And good practice is when you put it together to slide, uh, arrange the socket so the notch is in the right place so that when it comes time to put your pin in, anybody can figure out which way to put the chip in because you line up the two notches and then all your pins match. One of the beautiful things about this is in the event that you damage your chip uh, while you're using it, you can then pull the chip out of your board and you don't have to re-solder everything. So sockets are a really important part when you're soldering into something. Now, you don't need to use them with your uh, breadboard because they're the, the legs generally aren't long enough to fit into your breadboard. So you can plug the um, uh, IC directly into the breadboard, but uh, if when it comes time to solder it up somewhere, put in that socket and uh, you should be golden. Okay, I'm gonna come back and talk more about the rest of the parts on here, but I wanted to keep talking about the, uh, the, the 555 for just a moment right here. And as I move my mouse around onto the other screen, uh let's see right here i'll drag this window out right here and make it a little bit bigger and okay pop there we go i just wanted to bring that schematic up i don't know why i had it written on the camera down below i just wanted to point out on the schematic that you can see the pin numbers written down right in here we've got one two um where are we right here? Bring the mouse over. We've got one, two, uh, where's three, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. Now, you'll notice that the way they're laid out on the schematic has very little to do with how they're physically laid out on the chip. And in fact, that kind of makes sense when you think about it, because this doesn't look like a speaker and that doesn't look like a capacitor either. The schematic is a symbolic diagram that tells the story of the chip, okay? If you read the words on a printed page, if you read the words, uh, Jack climbed a giant beanstalk, those words don't look anything like Jack or a beanstalk, but they contain some symbolic information that let you develop a picture of what Jack climbing a beanstalk is gonna look like. So right on here, this doesn't look like your circuit, but it tells you the story of the circuit and it tells you how to hook that up. And we'll use uh, these pin numbers to put things together in just a moment. You can also see that they have names and I'll talk about those also in just a moment. In fact, let me swap around some of the screens right here and put this. Always lose my mouse when I do this. Too many screens, too much going on. And uh, let me bring up a data sheet right here. There we go. Okay, now, <clears throat> for the purposes of this course, you're probably wondering, well, what's going on inside that chip? How does it run? And for the purposes of this course, I'm going to tell you that that chip works 100% on black magic. It really shortens this lecture if I tell you it works 100% on black magic uh, because there's two things you need to know about black magic. It runs, black magic as you know, uh, works with fire and smoke. And so that chip has a whole bunch of fire and smoke packed into it. 
And if you ever cast the wrong spell and that smoke comes out of the chip, it's going to stop working until you can get the smoke back in there. Okay, so be really careful when you're working with the chips. Any kind of integrated circuit, they run on black magic. If you let the smoke out, the magic is gone and you need to get it back in before it'll work again. Put the genie back in the bottle, it's pretty hard to do. Now, that's, of course, a little bit of, uh, of a cop-out. But in many ways, you know, if you're working with junior electronics students, it's okay if you leave things for them to learn in future years. Now, if you did want to point them to a reference that would help them learn more about the chip, the, the thing you're looking for is called a data sheet. And if you were to put in LM555, or even just 555, followed by the word data sheet, you're going to come up with a document that looks something like this. This is the one made by Texas Instruments. There's different chips, uh, different 555 versions made by different manufacturers. So you might find one from somebody else, but Texas Instruments, you can usually count on to put together a good data sheet. And uh, data sheets, it's if you're going into electronics, it's used to get, uh, it's good to get used to reading them because they contain a lot of the information about all the components that you need. In fact, in some of our other courses in material science, there's data sheets for different steels as well. And they're technical publications that are sometimes a bit, uh, a bit difficult to read. They use technical jargon, but they have some standard formats for electronics. They'll start out with a little bit of a sales pitch at the beginning, telling you uh, what's good about it and what you might use it for. And then there'll be a little description right here, kind of the summary of the lab right up. And then it'll tell you what packages it comes in. So I was saying we had the PDIP package, an eight pin plastic dual inline package. You could guess, also get them in the SOIC, the small outline integrated circuit package. And uh, ooh, look at that, the very small, small outline package, uh, three millimeters by three millimeters. How would you like to be working with a chip that's three millimeters by three millimeters? Uh, so that's kind of cool, in fact, Everything that's on that three millimeter chip is also on this big nine millimeter by six millimeter chip that we're using. Um, it's just, uh, we've got a big package around it so we can actually grip it and fit it into the board. Uh, these two dials, the, the small outline package and the small outline integrated circuit, those are designed for what we call surface mount soldering. And if you take a look at a lot of modern electronics, re one of the reasons they're so powerful and cheap is that rather than having to drill holes all the way through the board, you just take a very small device and you rest it on top of the copper traces and uh, with a little bit of solder paste on there, run it through an oven and everything gets soldered into place. Um, and some skill that we can learn in the shop, but we're going to master uh, through hole soldering first. Now, what's really cool about the 555 and some of the simpler chips that we use is that there's actually a schematic diagram for the chip. And you can take a look at that schematic diagram and every single component on there pretty much is one that you've talked about already. Okay, uh, we have on here we have lots of transistors. I forget how many transistors there are, something like 27 transistors on the chip. And we've got some resistors. And that's about it. We've got some uh, NPN transistors not pointing in. And we've got some PNP transistors pointing in proudly. Now, a couple of these are, are a little fancier transistors with a couple different outputs. Uh, but uh, basically, you could probably walk into the back room of the electronics shop and pick up enough pieces to build your own equivalent of the 555 timer chip. Good luck getting it down into three millimeters by three millimeters though. Thanks to the uh, advances in integrated circuit manufacture, we could just keep shrinking this down and uh, make these transistors microscopic. And uh, they actually uh, work quite well at the microscopic size. Uh, electrons have less distance to travel between them, so they actually work faster as you make small ones. Now, as you go through a data sheet, there will also be uh, all sorts of useful information about which pins are where. And this one you can see actually shows the different functions of the pins relative to an actual outline of the chip. So rather than the schematic, which uh, doesn't have to follow the layout of the chip at all, this one does. It's got some terms and concepts in here that you haven't seen yet. Don't worry about that. Um, 
just get used to the idea that when you're looking at a chip, there'll be something that explains what it goes on. And um, as you stick with electronics and as you learn more and as you read more data sheets, these become a little easier to read and understand. You get familiar with the format and some of the words and what you might expect to find and where to look for them. It takes a while, but I just want to point out these data sheets are here. And if you're curious about a better explanation than black magic, the data sheet's not a bad place to start. Okay, because here you can see a quick description of which each pin is and what it does. And then you can go down here. You've got all your absolute maximum ratings. Quite often in a circuit, they'll show you some nice graphs of voltage to current when you're looking through it. Uh, you'll come down here and, you know, your functional block diagram sort of giving you a, a conceptual level of how it's working. And uh, then sometimes you'll see some different circuits that they'll provide and some examples of the different output that you could get and different things that you can do uh, using this chip. So a data sheet will go on for many, 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 many pages and you don't actually have to read all of them and I'm not going to talk about all of them right now but uh, anyway uh, data sheets are a great thing and a great resource and with that I'm going to make that data sheet go away okay so now we're back to looking at this circuit and uh, let's we've talked about the uh, 555 timer and the chip right up here uh, you're going to need a battery for it. This runs great with a 9-volt battery. And I've just put a little amp connector on here, a little uh, dongle so I can plug it into my uh, breadboard fairly easily. You could just plug the wires straight in. This one has a power switch. It's an on-off switch. If you happen to have a spare switch sitting around, you could do that. Otherwise, a quick, uh, a quick cheat when you're working with a 9-volt battery as your power supply is only clip it on to uh, one of the terminals and then you just sort of slide it on like that and now your 9 volt battery's on and then turn it off like that now your 9 volt battery's off and if you're going away for a while and not going to use it pop it right off of there and make sure when you leave your 9 volt battery lying around that you don't leave those two terminals connected to something metal like that if you put this upside down and put it in your pocket and there's a coin in your pocket um, well, it's one way to warm yourself up on a cold winter day. I've only done it once or twice. It doesn't get that hot, but but you know something's weird down there. Okay, uh, let's take a look at some of the other things that you are going to need in here. We have uh, C2 right down here. Now it says C2 is a 680 picofarad capacitor. And so if I hold that in at just the right angle should be able to see that say 681 how close can i get to that before it starts to blur out there we go got it 681 j now you don't need to worry about the j the j is kind of like that fourth band on a resistor uh, it tells you the tolerance and sometimes they'll also slip information in there about the maximum voltage capaci uh, capacity of the capacitor. What we're really interested in is that 681 because we want 680 picofarads right here. So 681 means 68 times 10 to the 1, that's where the 1 goes, picofarads. So 68 times 10 equals 680 picofarads right there. So uh, so we've got the right capacitor right there if it says 681. R1 is going to be a 300k ohm resistor. Okay. Now, keep in mind, if you put a 300 ohm resistor in there, you're going to be off by about 1,000. So don't do that. I mean, nothing's going to blow up. You're not going to let the smoke out of that uh, black magic chip. But uh, what we're looking at right here, so uh, notice my chip's not, or my resistor's not exactly 300K. In fact, 300K resistors aren't nearly as common as 330. And I don't like the color resolution right there. Uh, when you actually look at this for real, this is, uh, this is orange for three orange for three 
and then yellow right in there, followed by a gold line for plus or minus 10% accuracy. So the color rendition that I'm seeing on my monitor kind of looks brownish, but that's really orange, orange, yellow. Don't, don't believe your monitor right there. So if I've got orange, orange, yellow, what that gives me is three, three times 10 to the fourth. I always have to go through and do that in my head a little bit, make sure I get that right. And so 3, 3 times 10 to the fourth is 33 times 1, followed by four zeros, 10,330,000. 10, so the other way to say it, you've probably caught on to this already, is uh, Jason, you've got an intermediate step. You can skip over that entirely and say, that's 3, 3, followed by four zeros. That works fine too. And that is 330,000 ohms. So when we bring that back and say, well, 1,000 ohms is 1K ohm, that is a 330K ohm resistor that I have right there. Now, keep in mind when you're doing a lot of these uh, electronics projects, if your resistors are reasonably accurate, um, your capacitors are reasonably accurate. Sounds might be a little bit different, but by and large, most of your circuits will still work. Now, when I say reasonably accurate, I'm talking about plus or minus 10%. And you think about that, 330 is within plus or minus 10% of 300. Um, or it's pretty close to it. And uh, that's with actually within the accuracy range of that band. Uh, or sorry, gold is plus or minus 5%. Silver is plus or minus 10%. Um, so you get natural variation in resistors anyway. So if you don't have the right one, try the nearest one that you've got. Okay, over here we've got uh, a 10K resistor. So when I take a look at that, I've got brown, black, orange. So brown is one, black is zero, times 10 to the orange is three, or 10 followed by three zeros ohms also known as 10K or 10K ohms, if you like to put that ohm back in there. Okay, so there's a, a couple of resistors that we're gonna use. Down here, I've just got a couple wires ready to go. Now, the, the trick behind the water piano is that what you're gonna do is you're gonna take one end right here, H1, and you're gonna put that resting in some water. And then you're gonna take H2, and that's gonna come off the board and you are going to hold on to H2. And then this is resting in water and you're gonna come along and you're gonna complete the circuit by touching the water. And electricity is going to flow through you in through here or vice versa in the opposite direction. And as that electricity flows through you, you discharge this capacitor causing the trigger button to go uh, change its voltage and triggering the 555 timer to send an output signal causing the speaker to make some noise. Very brief summary of what it does. We'll take a look at that in a little bit more detail in just a moment. But that's why I've got two wires ready to go. And what actually works really good in here as a, a big heavy nut or bolt or just any old piece of conductive stuff, okay? It's just got to sit in water and it's nice if you can have um, the wire hooked up to it. If you look at my other YouTube video on the water piano circuit where I've made one using a printed circuit board and, um, and an aluminum case, I've actually got the aluminum case sitting in water and I just run the wire to the case and that's heavy enough to keep it sitting still in the water. Other components we have on here, uh, we've got a capacitor right here and this one says 103J on it try and get that so it's not too glary for you. So it should say 103 on there. Now, if you don't have exactly a 10 nanofarad capacitor, um, don't panic about it. Uh, find your closest capacitor to that. And just like the closest resistor did the trick, you should be fine. But somewhere in your kits, uh, I think I've given you a, a 10 nanofarad capacitor. It's a pretty standard size. And so what we've got there is in the 103, I've got one zero times 10 to the three picofarads, okay? And so 
one zero times 10 to the three, that's one zero followed by three zeros picofarads. And 1,000 picofarads is one nanofarad. So we can call that 10 nanofarads rather than 10,000 picofarads, which is a little bit of an awkward way to refer to it. The other way you might see this referred to is as a UO1 capacitor. Okay, now keep in mind that uh, when we look at our metric prefixes, uh, we go from uh, milli, okay, so millimeters, we go to micro, okay, our microamps or microfarads, then we go to our nano, and then to our pico. So each one of these has a difference of a thousand between them. So a thousand nanofarads is one microfarad. So if I've got 10,000 picofarads like we had right there, that would be the same as 10 nanofarads because we've come up by a thousand or 0 0.010 microfarads. We really don't use the millifarads uh, all that much. So uh, you might see this referred to as a 0.01 microfarad capacitor, or sometimes we'll abbreviate that. We'll uh, use a U in the place of the decimal point because it's a micro, and you could see it referred to as a U01 capacitor. So three or four different names for the same thing, but uh, once you get used to that naming mechanism, it all makes sense and it kind of runs through in the background of your head. I know in first semester of electronics, it doesn't make a lot of sense. It's okay. Um, it'll grow on you over a while and you'll get better at your metric prefixes. And here's one that's really easy to identify because the 10 microfarad capacitor is big enough to have 10 microfarads written right on it. Okay. Now this style of capacitor, uh, as we know, is called an aluminum electrolytic capacitor and the electrolytic capacitors are the polarized capacitors. And you'll notice that this one has a line on it with the minus signs, and therefore that is the leg that's gonna to go to the negative connection. And if we look down right here, you can see that that curve is going down to ground. That's where your negative connection is gonna go. And just in case you missed that, there's a big honking plus right on here so that you know the positive side goes off to pin three. Okay, so there's all of our components that you're going to need for making this circuit. Um, let's take a look at this little diagram that I've got hooked up uh, down here. And this is on Falstad's circuit simulator. Now, uh, this is uh, a website that I've been using for a long time. And uh, I just whipped this circuit up uh, on Falstad Simulator, F-A-L-S-T-A-D dot com slash circuit. You need to add the slash circuit to get there because it's Falstad's Circuit Simulator. Um, and so what we've got going on right in here is I've got the 555 five, five timer in uh, something of a schematic view. I've got my 9-volt signal coming down right here to our VN. And the 9-volt also comes around and connects to our reset pin. And if you look at your schematic, you'll see that uh, the 9 volt line coming in from the switch connects to pin 8 and to pin 4. And one of them's called VCC for your VN, and the other one's called RST for your reset. So that kind of follows what's going on right there. You've got some other pins hooked up here. Your output pin is marked as pin three. It comes through a capacitor. And on your circuit, this is gonna show up as a speaker. Uh, Falstad simulator doesn't have a good way to uh, simulate a speaker. So I just put an eight ohm resistor in there because you'll see that a lot of speakers have, um, yep, where's that gone? Uh, the speaker I'm gonna be using is an eight ohm speaker. If you're using the speaker on your big bad breadboard board, which you'll probably be doing, uh, that's going to be a 32 ohm impedance speaker. Oh, something just froze in my recording right here. There we go. Ooh, scary, I always get worried when these things freeze up like that. Am I gonna lose everything? 32 ohm, one watt speaker, gonna work great 
a couple of bucks at your local electronic shop and you'll be making really loud annoying noises um, so what you actually see happening in uh, in this circuit right here is uh, the little lines indicate the flow of electricity and you can see that there's little squirts of electricity coming down into V in and coming out V out sometimes and at other times uh, V out is actually pulling current in from that way through the capacitor and sending it down to ground and you can see excuse me electricity flowing down to ground right here uh, what's controlling that over here is this collection of uh, this resistor and uh, this uh, uh, this capacitor right here combined with that resistor and right here down at the bottom I've put a variable resistor in and that variable re resistor represents you and the water the further you go down the water, the higher resistance you're going to get, and the closer you come, the lower resistance you're going to get. So you're sort of going to be a fixed resistor, and your finger's position on the water is going to be a variable resistor. And you can see that if I move my finger closer, like I'm doing right here, the resistance is going to go down. And on our oscilloscope at the bottom, you'll notice that the frequency of these pulses has started to go up. They're closer together, meaning that they're happening more rapidly. And now it's gone up some more. And so we're getting a high frequency signal. And that's gonna come out as a really high pitch note. And you can see everything in here is flashing back and forth a lot more rapidly too. Okay, so when you bring your finger down, really close to your circuit and poke it into the water, then you're gonna get a high frequency sound. Whereas if you go out at the other end of the water, and here you can see your finger sliding along the resistor right down here, you can see those peaks get a lot further apart. And we've actually got a reading right on here. This is telling us that we're going to get a sound when we're out at the end and we're at the low resistance side, somewhere around 200, 240 hertz. It's gonna vary a little bit depending on uh, how well your body conducts and how well your conductive your water is. Uh, if you're out in Saskatchewan or up in my hometown of Dawson Creek or somewhere like that where you've got hard water with lots of ions in it, it'll be a little bit more conductive and you'll get a different tone than if you're down in Vancouver where we've got fresh, uh, uh, fresh mountain water that uh, hasn't had a chance to absorb all of the uh, all of the minerals. So uh, we can play back and forth with that a little bit, and you can see that as we change the resistance right in here, we get different frequencies. They're going to range from a couple hundred hertz to, you know, when we come in as close as we go right here. Just takes it a second for it to calculate the um, overall voltage. You know, up to about three kilohertz. That's that's a nice range of uh, sounds that could very quickly get to be very annoying. Uh, and like I say, uh, high school students love it because, man, if there's one thing they like doing, it's being annoying. They're almost as annoying as the teachers sometimes. <laughs> uh, let's see. Let's transition away from right here. And I'm just going to leave that running in the background because I have nothing else to fill that part of my screen. And let's take a look at how we're going to put some of this together. So I've just uh, picked up a, a spare breadboard that I had kicking around and uh, move that schematic out of the way. There we go. I'm going to bring this down a little bit so I can zoom in on where I'm going to be working. Yeah, sorry about that. Didn't mean to drop you on the face in the middle of my desk. And uh, let's bring that down even a bit more. There we go. Now this is going to give you a good view of what's going on on that breadboard. And to start out, um, you'll notice that I've got some uh, power and ground running to the different sides. I've got my 9 volt battery clip disconnected, but make sure that it's going to plug in. However, you've got it hooked up to plug in. I'm just going to put that in so it's on there and when I hook up a battery I'll have a power supply two power and ground okay and you can take your chip and usually a good idea when you're working with an integrated circuit to start with your chip and it goes somewhere right in the middle and you can see that your breadboard has been specifically designed to handle chips this size there is a each of these spaces is 2.54 millimeters apart which happens to be a hundred thou or one tenth of an inch and uh, each of the standard spacing on legs on uh, chips 
is one tenth of an inch. So standard chips fit in standard breadboards anywhere on the planet. Um, pretty cool thing. Okay, so we've got that 555 timer slop, uh, slapped in there. And uh, take note of where pin one is. Okay, there's that notch out of the chip. And right to the left of that, when you're looking at it in there, is where we're going to start counting. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight, right. Don't go to nine. Now, for putting your um, circuit together, and let me uh, just whip over here, and there we go. Okay, now I'm in here, and I can mark where I'm going to start. Pick something easy to start with, okay? And uh, I'm going to start right here with pin one, because pin one goes straight down to ground. Okay, so let's take pin one on there, and I've done this circuit already, so I've got a line already hooked up. And sometimes when I'm working on these and things are getting really fine, I like to use needle nose pliers to fit things in. And take the time when you're putting your circuit together to cut everything nice and neat and tidy and make sure it fits down flush to your board. I know I've said that in every video up until now. And uh, I had students today uh, in a different class who were just trying to do it quickly. They didn't want to cut things down until they had it running, and then they were going to go back and tidy it up afterwards. And it doesn't work that way because they spent more time trying to sort the legs apart so they weren't touching each other and that they, weren't have, they, they were having problems that they didn't need to have because they didn't take the five seconds or 10 seconds or whatever it takes to make nice, neat trim connections. Okay, there we've got number one hooked up. And actually, you know, I think seeing as how number one was so fun and easy, let's come up here and let's do number eight and number four. They're gonna come up here to our power supply. We're just gonna use the nine volt battery clip as the switch, but um, right up on this side of the circuit. So pin eight is coming in right here. <laughs> on my other board where I had this worked up. <laughs> I think I had my positive on the inside line. This is just stretching a little bit. Give it a wiggle and make sure that you've got a good connection anytime you put something in there. It should really feel like it's sunk in there and it's holding on well because it really stinks when you uh, put it together and you, uh, you think you've got a good connection, but it's a little bit loose underneath. There we go. That one's a little bit nicer fit. You can see on this breadboard here, I had to add a couple little jumpers. This one actually doesn't have a continuous power rail all along the top. It splits right here in the middle. So um, by now you should know whether your breadboard needs one of those. But uh, just keep in mind that some breadboards have... Um, different power on this side than on this side, and you have to join them together, just like uh, you would join um, the circuit from this side over to this side quite often. Sometimes we don't do that, but sometimes we do. All righty, there we go. We've got uh, a couple of easy things done right here. Let's keep going for the quick wins and do the easy stuff on here. And this capacitor looks really easy. C3 is going to come off pin 5 and go down to ground. Uh, okay, so there's pin 5, comes to C3 and straight down to ground. That was our 10 nanofarad capacitor. So go in there and count out uh, 1, 2, 3, 4. Well, what do you know? I hope you guys were saying, what the heck's he putting that red one in there for? That's not pin five. Or that's not pin four. I wanted that going to pin four. There we go. Oh, hey, this is going to fit together really, really nicely. I should have used the shorter one down here. Anyway, there we go. Pin four. I get talking on the video and I can't count to four. Good thing I came back and counted to number five. So here we go. One, two, three, four. Four goes to the positive power supply. Five's right over here. And five goes into ground. 
you got to wiggle these around a little bit to get them in sometimes. And there we go. That capacitor is just long enough to make a nice little fit over there into ground. 10 nanofarad capacitor jumping from that pin to ground. Now keep in mind, you don't have to put it right into this pin right here because this entire row is all hooked up electrically to everything else in that entire row. Um, let's go on. What's uh, pretty easy right now? Well, uh, we could come and we could do pin three comes to a capacitor, then it comes to our speaker, and then it comes to ground. Okay, so that was our 10 microfarad capacitor. Let's find pin three. Keep in mind, you've got that plus on there, okay, because that's your uh, electrolytic capacitor. And so we will go from pin three, we'll put our positive side to one, two, three right in there. And then I'll jump this out to a different row somewhere out over here so I've got room. Things aren't all jammed together in there. Could probably even come out one more. Yeah, it's good to keep it compact. So that one right now is sitting in this row right in here. And this is where you could hook up the speaker from your big bad breadboard board. Or like I said, I've got um, a nice little speaker here with some orange and black wire. And so there you can see the edge of the speaker. It's kind of big to put on there. I'll put the black wire into ground. And I'll put the orange wire into where that speaker comes out. And there we go. Now my uh, speaker is plugged in there. And like I said, it doesn't have to be that specific speaker. Just about any little small speaker is going to work fine in here. Uh, where did we go right now? We've got all of this stuff done. This, this circuit actually goes together fairly quickly. If you've got a good integrated circuit, most of the magic's taking place inside your, uh, inside your chip. So what's coming in here next? Well, this one's a little bit trickier to read. So let's take a moment to take a look at this one right here. So right here, we connect in to the power supply line. We come down through here. There's no dot, so there's no intersection right there. It doesn't connect anywhere else. And then this resistor, comes in right here and then it comes right over here and it connects to pin seven. So really this resistor is between pin seven and the positive power supply line. Now there is one more thing tucked in here. We will get to that in just a minute, but it runs between seven and the power supply line, even though it's not drawn in there as a straight line, okay? It was put down here so that you could see H1 and H2, the two headers that are gonna reach out and uh, allow you to make beautiful music uh, sitting right next to each other because they're really important to the circuit. So anyway, uh, let's take a look at that. Let's find our 10K resistor. And between pin seven and ground. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Well, there's eight, so we should be able to figure out where seven is. And I think this is a job for the needle nose pliers. Between pin seven and ground, we put a 10K resistor right in there. And then we've also got, uh, let's see, I'm gonna use green for this because I've got a green wire that's gonna come off right here in H2. And this is just one of those wires that I'm gonna to be touching later on to help complete this circuit. And that comes right in there. And that goes right where the 10K resistor meets with, uh, meets with pin seven. And that's just gonna come out to a little connection right here that I'm gonna be able to touch with my finger to make me part of the circuit. Alrighty, um, now you can see on here that uh, pin six and pin two are joined together. Now, technically pin eight and pin four also show up as being joined together, but by connecting each of them to the positive power supply line, this comes up here, it's connected right here, comes down over here and over to here. And so pin eight and pin four are connected together right in here. Just wait for a second. There we go. Pin eight and pin four are connected together right in there. So we did connect them together. We just did it through kind of a roundabout way. Um, 
we're not going to do that roundabout way for pin uh, pin six and pin two. Uh, okay, pin six and pin two, we are going to actually jumper them together. And I've got a piece of wire folded up nicely to allow us to do that. And let's see, pin four, five, six, seven, and comes off pin two right over here. Okay, so there is pin two, and a purple wire comes around and jumps it into pin one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, pin six and pin two are now connected together. And uh, we've done that with that. I should have used purple. We've used a purple wire right there. You'll notice um, that when I put them together, I didn't jump the wire right over the top right in here. Okay, I do that for a couple reasons. One, it lets you read the number on the chip to make sure what you still know what it is. Two, if you ever let the magic, uh, black magic smoke out of your chip, now you can pop that chip out and pop a new one in there. And so you save yourself uh, a lot of effort uh, by not wrapping and tying that chip right into the middle right in there. It also makes it a little bit easier to diagnose and troubleshoot because I'm not running around saying which pin is it going to. I've got a nice, clean, clear shot and uh, good visibility on what's going on. Saying that's the rule, there are times when you have to break rules, but really this one works out pretty good. Try to avoid it. Now, the electrons really don't care where you run them, but I care, and you should too. All righty, we've got those two joined together between pin six and pin two. Let's carry on with that, and let's come out here and find that 300K ohm resistor. Okay, keep in mind I said we had a 330K ohm resistor. And you can plug that in just about, uh, well, at either point, because these two are joined now. You could put it in right up here if you wanted or you could put it down here. Uh, so long as the other end of the resistor is not plugged into anything on the chip, um, I'm gonna go right up here, okay? And that comes just off the end. Let me drop that in right there. Now you can see, to keep it nice and compact, I actually bent the legs in a little bit uh, I use my needle nose pliers to do that. I'm also going to double check right here, and you got to be careful with some of this. See, that's a little bit close in there. See how that's uh, an exposed part of that resistor, and that's an exposed part of that resistor? I'm really not keen on having those two close together. So what I'm going to do to fix that, I could either pull this one out and put it down here, or I can pull this resistor out and shorten it up a little bit. Just going to bend those legs. Your pliers come in really handy here. Just straighten that out. And then make it just that hair shorter on that end. hair shorter on that end and then remember where it went because uh, you want to put it back and that was the 10k resistor went between um, the pin 7 and your power supply line have to get in there and There we go. Yay. Okay, and you see what I've done right here? I've still got um, the chip between uh, pin seven. And there's our output right there. And now it goes up there, but now those two aren't close to each other. Okay, just a quick fix. If yours wasn't close, you don't have to worry about it. Um, in fact, even if it was close, you're probably going to get away with it okay. It's just if they were touching, that can be a problem. And sometimes what happens is they're not touching now, but if they're close, they get bumped and later on they start to touch. Okay, so what we're looking at is that was uh, this resistor right here, uh, the 300K ohm resistor. And it came up and it connected 
right through there. And we put that in to pin six. And now we've got a loose end right down here. And I'm gonna take another one of these little wires right here. This is the one that I've got the uh, metal bracket to for sitting down in the water when it comes time to run it. And I'm just gonna pop that in right in there. Okay, I'm just gonna put that off to the side with the green wire. And uh, that's how I'm gonna control the tone of the circuit when we're running it. And finally, we've got another connection that comes right off of here. And that's gonna be to uh, C2. And C2 is gonna jump down to ground. And here's my C2 right in here. Now, I'm gonna put it in somewhere and I'm not gonna talk about it for a second. I'm just gonna let you think about what I just did because I did something perfectly fine. Does that connect it to ground? Talk about, I don't have to stay quiet. Press pause and take a look at it for a little bit. And uh, after you've thought about it, uh, I'll give you the answer right here because the answer is yes. So what we've got going on right here is you can see I've got a ground connection coming up off uh, this side of the board right down here, which means that every uh, because I've got a good ground connection. Every hole in this set of five is ground. So that's how I was able to connect uh, pin one to ground. But I've also got all these empty spaces right here that are at ground. Well, now um, I want to connect. Uh, you can see that we want either pin two or pin six to connect to this capacitor that then connects to ground. So I've got ground on that side right there. Well, here's pin two. Pin two is already connected to pin six. So whatever's in these holes right here is electrically the same as whatever's in these holes right here because they're connected together by a wire. Be an entirely different world if these were connected together by a resistor or a capacitor or some other component. But because they're connected by a wire, which we assume is zero ohms resistance, and that's a bit of a lie, but we'll talk more about that in a future course. Um, uh, it's close enough for today's purposes. We'll assume that that's uh, all hooked up in there. And uh, so now I've connected pin two to the capacitor, which goes straight to ground. And in the process, because it's already connected into pin six, we've also connected pin six to that capacitor. So I've ran out of components now. Uh, I think it's time for me to add my battery and see if I can make interesting noises. So here we go, the battery's on. Now, you might hear, let me just, you might hear a click when you first plug it in, that's the capacitor charging up, uh, okay? And then it should go quiet. And then what you're gonna do is take these two wires that you've just hooked together, and you don't need water to do your first test, just squeeze one and squeeze the other. And, uh, that sound should be coming through here. And if you let go of either side, the resistance in there becomes infinite. There's nothing to join them together. Now, you can control a little bit of the tone of the sound right now by controlling how good a connection you have. So if you just touch gently on one of those, you can make it sound like, I don't know, a squealing calf stuck in the mud or something like that. So now what you do is you get your water and you run a streak of water. Is that gonna stay in place or are you guys gonna collapse onto my desk again? There we go. You take this, you put it into a streak of water Actually, in good 2020 terms, I tried it with hand sanitizer the other day and it worked great. So streak your water out right along in here, rest this in the water, squeeze one connector and then tap into the water stream and you will get uh, different notes being played. You'll be able to slide it back and forth and uh, do, you know, do some scales uh, and get creative with the lovely uh, melodic tones that you're gonna be making with your circuit. Um, so there you go, that's uh, uh, a sem 
breadboarding of the water piano. Now there is another version of the uh, water piano that, uh, that that I've seen done. And instead of using a streak of water, it's called the Draudio. And you take a pencil and you draw a line right on here. And the graphite in the pencil is not very conductive. In fact, it's a very good resistor, but it is conductive. And if you can get a good connection right in there, this is not set up for doing it. So I'm not getting a sound right on there, but you'll see a Draudio and they use slightly different components and you're able to draw a graphite um, a pencil drawn uh, streak instead of a streak of water and you can draw it into whatever shape you want and if you've got a really good connection at one end then you can come in there and you can touch the pencil and depending on where you touch your line drawing you get um, different sounds. Alrighty folks, um, wow, less than an hour and I've talked about a circuit and how it comes together and uh, this is like I say this is a really fun one we do this up in a couple of different ways and uh, high school students really like it. There's a lot of students who've got uh, a little bit of musical background. They play piano uh, on the weekend, whether they want to or not, mom makes sure of it. And uh, then they uh, uh, come in and they start playing little single note pieces of music uh, on there. And some of them get really creative with that. So uh, anywho, um, there we go. I'm gonna disconnect that because I don't need power going to it anymore and uh, have fun making the water piano.